There's also this idea of altruism. Here's where you run into something where people say that humans are really, really different. I'm, I'm still not sure how what I think about it. Altruism, by definition, means an organism is sacrificing more than it gains from an action. Normally we think of it as you help someone else and you get nothing in return. That's not actually required. All that means is I help you out, but you don't give me back as much. So like if I give you five dollars and you give me four later and say that's all I got and you say oh that's fine whatever that would sort of be altruism because you're not getting back as much. But if I give you five bucks and say oh yeah there'll be ten percent interest compounded monthly, <laughs> that's not altruism because I'm getting back more than I gave. So that's what <laughs> altruism would have to be. So in terms of animals, it's really hard to tell because there's a lot of things that look like altruism that may not be. This example shows a prairie dog that's up on a mound at one, at one of their colonies that's yelling. They give alarm signals when they see potential predators. And it turns out that the one giving the signal in many cases is more likely to get eaten than the ones that don't. This sounds like altruism because you're helping out others and you might die from it. Well, it turns out that the ones who do this are the females. And this species, the females are all related because the females all stay in the colony and the males migrate out to find new mates. So the females are calling to help the other females because they're their relatives. They're helping their sisters and their nieces and their aunts and mothers and things like that. So they're helping it. So this is probably kin selection, not altruism, because they do genetically get a benefit as a result of doing that. There's also things like this where you've got the cat taking care of the mouse, or you know, you've seen all sorts of these weird, crazy things on TV. They'll say, oh, look at the zoo. The, the uh, panda has fallen in love with the monkey, or the gorilla has fallen in love with the cat, or whatever. I personally think this is just misplaced behavior because a lot of animals have what's called imprinting, which means they focus in on early stimuli and they treat that first stimuli, set of stimuli as being their parents. So you know, you take baby birds and you raise them, they will treat you as if you were a bird. They'll even try to mate with you, they'll you know, do the mating dances for you that they do for the other members of their species. And so what's going on there I think is misplaced. I don't think that's out. The cat is not trying to help the mouse. The cat for whatever reason, if this happened at the right time when the hormone levels in the cat were high enough to initiate parental behavior, and the mouse just happened to be there, it's interaction of hormones, and, and the same sort of thing occurs with us, you know, when you see the, the, the poor uh, puppy at the, at the uh, animal shelter when you walk, you know, you feel that, that tightening that says, oh, I should take care of it. These are natural behaviors that help make sure you take care of your own offspring, but they can be misplaced, because it turns out that all infants in mammals have the same trait of having really big heads and really big eyes. That's why puppies and kittens are cute, because they look like babies. I mean, that's why we're attracted to them. That's why they, they cease to be cute in most cases when they grow up, because they they're no longer have those characteristics. But that's a, a trait to all mammals, that the babies have a large head and, and big eyes as part of that, which initiates parental behavior regardless of the mammal. But there is one case of altruism that's been studied and definitely shown to be true. These are vampire bats. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture. It's not very good quality. But in vampire bats, they go out, they drink blood. And in the case of a vampire bat, if it doesn't feed for three nights in a row, it's going to die. They can't go more than three nights without feeding. But it's not uncommon for a vampire bat to go out and not be successful. So the odds of them dying are actually fairly high throughout their lives. But vampire bat colonies tend to be fairly stable. And what happens is when you're a vampire bat, one of the first things you do when you come back every morning is you, you all groom each other. And you can tell when another vampire bat is fed because their belly is all distended from the blood that they've drank, drunk, they've had, whatever. Um, and so if you are grooming somebody who is successful and you weren't, you do this little beg display and they'll throw up a little bit of blood that'll keep you alive because the little bit of blood they give up doesn't significantly shorten their life if they've just fed but the little bit of blood they give you adds on like a day and a half of your survival. So they're giving up a small amount and you're getting a big benefit from it. But they are giving something up. Most of the animals in here are related, so most of this is kin selection. However, they will regurgitate blood to non-relatives and they can tell relatives from non-relatives. And so they actually are being altruistic. Although it turns out that in a sense it may not be because it turns out they also have kind of a tit for tat where the next night it, the, the situation could easily be reversed and the animal would then reverse the behavior, hopefully. And interestingly, they punish cheaters. If you take <laughs> blood but don't share it, they'll kick you out of the colony. Also a trait of human altruism, that the person who, who says, oh, give me a buck, and you say, okay, fine, the next day you ask them for a buck, and they don't give you any, hopefully the next time they ask you, you know what, no, I'm not going to give you any because you still owe me one. We punish cheaters, 
animals punish cheaters. Again, not a unique characteristic of human beings. So, altruism in animals is probably incredibly rare, but it has been found in at least some cases. It's not completely unique to human beings. Now, when we examine in human beings, there are three situations where we normally cite as being altruistic. The professions that put you in danger at the expense of protecting other people are normally cited. Firefighters, police officers, and members of the military are all commonly cited as this, and I won't denigrate what they do. I would certainly not be willing to do what these guys about to do, which is charge into a building where a flame is shooting out. But um, when you think about this, you also have to be thinking about how humans did evolve. And again, we probably didn't evolve in huge societies like we have now. We probably evolved in very small tribes where you knew everybody. And so the odds are that when there was a situation that required sacrificing yourself, you were sacrificing yourself for either people you were related to or people you at least knew. So again, there was that possibility for tit for tat. That, you know, in the Indian tribe, when one person's parents dies, the other members of the tribe will take care of them. You know, they're, you're a member of our tribe, we're going to take care of you, even though you're not related to us. They'll still do that sort of behavior. So, in the case of human beings, I would say that some of these behaviors, it's difficult to say, are truly altruistic because they're sort of short-circuiting a human behavior that in the environment we evolved in, they would have been beneficial as opposed to having a cost. And... I would say there are situations that are truly altruistic by the definition. The people who went into the first, after the first tower fell, who turned around and ran to the second one. I mean, I don't think you would call it anything except altruism. I think, I think that with our conscious behavior, we, we, what we've done is we've spread our definition of our group. So that our genes say, take care of your group. And our group used to be our tribe, which was mostly our family. Now, with the way we work things, our group is now our society or our town, or you know, whatever it happens to be, we can define our group differently, which other animals can't do. So I think it is real, but you've got to think about the costs and the benefits again, just like you do for anything else. The individuals who do this kind of thing, I would argue, get a benefit in society, I would hope. That you know, when we see, especially after 9-11, when you saw someone who was a firefighter or a police officer, I bet you treated them differently than maybe you would have, like when the cops stopped you and wrote you a ticket, before 9-11, your thoughts toward them might have been much more aggressive and angry than after, right after 9-11 when you saw how many of them had died trying to help with that situation. That our, our idea of the group had changed and our idea of the behavior. So there are benefits to this behavior to the individual that most of them don't die in these activities. And so that they do get a, you know, some sort of societal benefit in terms of taking on these risky jobs. Um, I would still say, though, like I said, that it is real. I'm not, I'm not denigrating what they do. I'm just saying that evolutionarily, it's very difficult to tell the difference between a genetically programmed behavior and a truly altruistic one. And the cost-benefit ratio obviously varies. Now, I would suspect, and I, I know, that military recruiting is having a hard time right now because getting people to enroll in the military when there's an actual known cost is much more difficult than when there was no, like, Ten years ago, when there was nothing really dangerous going on, military recruitment was very easy. Oh yeah, come in for four years, get your money, get your pension, get your GI Bill, whatever, and you know, what are we going to do? We'll send you to a base, maybe, you know, well, Kosovo was going on then, but you know, before all this stuff happened, oh, we might send you to a base in Germany or something like that, but no one's going to shoot at you, or you'll be in some place relatively safe, was what the, you know, they made it like it was Votech school, really. Go and learn a skill fixing tanks that you'll be able to use in the real world, which with Hummers now, maybe that works, but um, it was easier then because the cost was low and the benefit was high. You got a bunch of benefits, you got the ability to say, oh yes, I was in the military, which gives you a societal benefit. Now, the cost is high, the benefit, you know, might be, is still high, I would say. You know, I've seen going through Atlanta Airport, the way people treat soldiers, which, again, I'm not saying they shouldn't, I'm just saying they do get a benefit from that, but the cost is much higher, unsurprisingly, the cost-benefit part of our brain, which is not even conscious, says, you know what, I think it would be better for me to try to find a job that doesn't involve people shooting at me, because right now, it's hard to get into the military without getting shot at. And so, you know, that's something where, the, as the cost-benefit ratio changes, human behavior changes with it, just the way you predict it would if it was happening the same way any other animal does. It. And so, why might this, this behavior, we've got where we can expand our group to a large